Okay, can I um, call this meeting to order and welcome you all to this, the sixth meeting of the Public Petitions Committee in this session. And can I remind members and others in the room to switch phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting. The first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. Um, the first item on the agenda is to invite us to consider whether we take care agenda item five, discussion on work, pri work programme in private. Do members agree to consider this item in private? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. We can then move on to agenda item number two, which is consideration of continuing petitions. The first petition we'll consider today is petition 1595 by Alexander Taylor. The petition calls for a moratorium on shared space schemes. We'll be taking evidence on the petition from Hamza Youssef, Minister for Transport in the Isles. The Minister is accompanied today by two officials, Jill Mulholland of Transport Scotland and Sandy Robinson of the Scottish Government. Can I welcome you to our meeting? Uh, Minister, before we turn to questions, can I ask if you have any opening comments that you would like to make? Thank you, uh, Convener. The Scottish Government is committed through Scotland's Road Safety Framework 2020 to achieving safer road travel in Scotland and protecting vulnerable road users such as uh, children, pedestrians, uh, pedal cyclists, uh, people with disabilities, of course, including those with visual impairments. Uh, the framework includes a commitment which states that the Scottish Government would publish national guidance on designing streets, focusing on the needs of pedestrians of all abilities. The National Guidance uh, Designing Streets was published in 2010 and provides Scottish local authorities with key considerations and guidance for the design and redesign of new and existing streets. It sets out, uh, uh, sets out a street user hierarchy which considers pedestrians first uh, and the private vehicle last. Uh, it clearly states that the design of all streets and spaces should be inclusive providing for all people, regardless of age or indeed ability. Uh, designing streets acknowledges the importance and complex role that streets play in supporting communities and in meeting ambitions in a number of policy areas, from supporting active travel options and improving public health, right the way through to reducing emissions, to increasing footfall and social interaction, and importantly, reducing the speed and dominance of vehicles and creating spaces, spaces which all people can access and enjoy. In order to do this, Designing Streets promotes a, a collaborative approach, uh, which is based on balanced decisions and the importance of local context and indeed local views. Designing Streets includes information on shared space. It sets out some of the design principles behind that concept. It does not actively promote or recommend shared space, but instead, instead highlights the potential benefits of creating streets that reduce the vehicle dominance, encourages social interaction, and creates a positive sense of place. An important element, element of the guidance within designing streets is the emphasis on the need to ensure that design is inclusive and the need to consider the needs of those with a disability in particular, again, people with a visual impairment. The guidance acknowledges that shared spaces, if not designed and developed in careful conjunction with road users, it can pose problems for some people with, uh, for some people who are partially sighted uh, or indeed uh, blind, and emphasises the importance in recognising that those uh, with a disability may require additional supportive measures. Uh, the detailed design of particular schemes developed by a local authority must recognise and respond to the needs of all users. Uh, design should be collaborative with representatives from local disability groups and access panels uh, invited to provide input from the early stages right the way through the development stages. Designing Streets sets out the national policy perspective and key design considerations. Uh, however, the implementation and interpretation is, of course, a local matter and needs to respond to the specific circumstances and indeed the local context. Uh, Scotland's first accessible travel framework, which I launched in September, contains a vision where all people with disabilities can travel with the same freedom, choice and dignity and opportunity uh, as other citizens. To achieve that vision, we are committed to listening to and involving people with a disability and making travel more accessible. Uh, disabled people told us that this is not just about transport, but also making sure they can get to their transport. Having accessible paths and road, buses stop, bus stops and stations that must be a part of that. Uh, in conclusion, convener, that is, that is why I'm keen that roads uh, authorities, Transport Scotland uh, for the trunk roads, of course, local authorities for the local roads collaborate 
and have ongoing engagement with local residents, including those with a disability and the representatives, to design a better streetscape uh, for all. Happy, of course, to take questions. Thank you very much for that. Can I maybe um, begin by asking, first of all, on this question of you've established a national policy. You say it's a matter for local authorities to implement it, which I understand the physical implementation of shared spaces makes sense. Why would it be a local interpretation of those policies if there were simple issues of rights of disabled people that apply right across the whole of the country? Mm. There is also a, a, a bit of guidance, which I think is very, very helpful uh, and useful uh, as well, which goes alongside designing streets and the guidance associated with designing streets. Uh, that is produced by, by, by Scots and, you know, the chief officers to do, Scotland's uh, chief officers of transport, uh, who have produced from a local level guidance that they think should apply to all 32 local authorities. And that's the National Roads Development Guidance. And inclusivity of shared spaces is very much a part uh, of that. Um, so there are examples of where shared spaces and local authorities have worked well, that uh, inclusivity of people with a disability and visual impairments have been a part of that from early inception stage, right the way through to development. And there's clearly areas where it could be done uh, better, but uh, we've done this in collaboration with local authorities, Scots primarily, uh, and those officers in, in transportation pr um, producing guidance uh, as well. That's not to say... I'm close-minded to seeing how that guidance can be uh, improved. Uh, and that's why we're here and have an interest in Mr Taylor's petition. Okay. I, mean, I suppose the point I'm trying to establish is, do you recognise that the national context of the rights of disabled people, wherever they live, to ensure that planning meets their needs? And therefore, while there may be room for local expression of what shared space looks like, there must be pretty fundamental basic things about the rights of disabled people that would apply generally, and would you therefore, if you're able to identify schemes that seem to be in contradiction to that, do you see a role for the Scottish Government in addressing that problem? Well, I mean, I think we're always happy to see if our guidance can be improved uh, to, to, to that extent. So, you know, taking this issue, we recognise that level surfaces, for example, can you know, cause difficulties for those uh, with, a, with a visual uh, impairment, but there are things that can be done uh, in order to address that, and I can come on to that uh, later on. Um, so if there is a local policy that uh, is not meeting the national standards, and let's remember that local authorities, of course, have public sector duties. Uh, they have to adhere to the Equalities Act 2010. The uh, arbitrators of that being the, 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 um, uh, the, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, ultimately the courts. Uh, there is redress if those national guidelines, both from a Scottish perspective but also UK national guidelines, uh, are not being adhered to. Uh, if the guidance, and the suggestion is that the guidance needs improved and, and, and further flesh needs to be put uh, on that guidance, I'm happy to explore it. But uh, you know, there shouldn't be That's local schemes that go in contradiction of national policy if they do. And as I say, there are some very fundamental duties that they have to uh, adhere to. And if that's not being done, then there are, uh, of course, enforcement uh, measures. It seems quite a significant escalation that somebody would have to go to the courts to enforce their rights when I suppose what I'm trying to establish is the extent to which the Scottish Government, in its planning guidance, is able to identify their basic issues around disability. So can I give you just maybe a simple example and, and, and get your response? Designing Street says there's a preference for controlled crossings for older and visually impaired pedestrians. And the word preference, I think we would agree, would seem to suggest a stronger liking for one option, but other options um, would be acceptable. I think that characterisation differs from the strength of opinion, certainly, that we've received and come across in his submissions about this petition. So would you consider changing the language in design of streets to reflect that strength of opinion that we have heard? It's not a question of you know, there's slight preference for one view other than the other, but there's a very strong preference um, for controlled crossings. Uh, if the committee uh, would like me to do that, of course, uh, I think it's a, an eminently sensible suggestion to do so. Uh, the reason why the word preference is because there can be, be other options, uh, tactile paving. Uh, there can be, for example, uh, very small delineations in the road of you know, 25 millimetres, for example, that wouldn't constitute a kerb, but would be uh, perhaps... Uh, uh, marked enough uh, in terms of a delineation so that somebody using a stick uh, might well be, be that might be helpful uh, to them um, but absolutely more than happy to look at the guidance having looked at mr taylor's um, petition and uh, seen some of i think the very genuine concerns 
uh, that he has raised and having the chance to even speak to him very briefly before coming in here, uh, one of the suggestions uh, I explored with my officials was can we work with uh, our partners when it comes to the guidance, uh, work with our partners at Edinburgh Napier uh, University, they have a transport institute um, and maybe we can have a seminar uh, to explore the exact um, concerns that the petitioner uh, has raised in his petition and see again how we can strengthen those guidance notes that exist. There's our own guidance, there's the Scots guidance and, and members may be aware that there's some UK government work being done on this in the back of uh, Lord, Lord Home of Richmond's report um, as well. So if you can take all of those uh, and, and, and you know any suggestions be, it be on, on changing some of the wording as, as you suggested convener uh, or perhaps more detailed um, discussions on, on the petitioner's concerns, I'd be more than happy to, to explore that. OK, thank you. Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, can I just first of all just declare an interest uh, in this as I um, am backing the campaign in, in this constituency um, with regard to this uh, scheme. Um, Transport Minister, part of the, the whole concept of shared space seems to be the anticipated behavioural change on the part of the drivers. Uh, pedestrians and other users of the space um, and a number of the submissions talk about the role of eye contact in, in that sense and, and what that means to be able to safely use the non-controlled crossing. Um, however, the point has been made that, that you know, many people are simply not in a position to make this type of change, for instance the visually impaired uh, people or people with cognitive issues, learning dif disabilities um, or other conditions. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that you use the word inclusivity a lot in your, your opening speech and um, you've now been talking about guidance. Um, the, the particular scheme um, I am talking about here is about to go live, if you like, in about two or three weeks' time with four-way non-controlled crossing, which frankly is, is terrifying that my constituents, that the very thought of going to it, particularly if they're, if they're, if they're less able. Can you just clarify... Um, what, I, know, I know that, uh, for instance, in this instance, with this local authority, uh, visually impaired groups and others were not consulted. And I know that you say that that's part of, of the whole, the, the, the whole uh, premise of it. Can you just clarify what can happen if that hasn't been done and it's going to be going ahead regardless? Uh, is that not a, a, a con contrib contravention of, of uh, the people's rights if they weren't consulted and are not being listened to? Yes, and I'm uh, reluctant, as the member would understand, to get right into the nitty-gritty of the, every local uh, decision on every local high street. I mean, uh, I can't, as a government minister, uh, mandate what happens in every local high street, but I uh, absolutely understand her concerns um, about the scheme that she's, uh, represent, uh, she, she, she's mentioned as a local representative. Um, if that was the case, as she surmised it, then it would be deeply worrying because all of the guidance, be it uh, our own guidance, be it Scots guidance, which was just from a local authority perspective, uh, or indeed even DFT guidance, although not necessarily applicable, but still uh, the outputs uh, very, very useful and helpful. Indeed, all talk about collaboration with local access panels, local disability groups, and so on and so forth. And um, I should say designing streets is predominantly aimed towards residential and what we call lightly trafficked streets. Yes. Mm -hmm. And um, that's not to say it's not applicable to town centres. I'm just saying it's, 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 it's aimed towards those lightly trafficked and, and residential areas. And therefore, if the um, guidance uh, of, design, of designing streets and the guidance associated with it were being implemented onto um, areas, town centres that are vehicle dominated, vehicle heavy, then clearly consideration has to be taken to those with uh, disability and visual impairments. If that hasn't been done, if it's causing danger to them, then we would certainly urge the local authority uh, to do more, to reconsider, to have further conversations. Can I, in direct answer to perhaps her, her question, can I, can I over, overturn the local authority decision? Of, of course, I, I couldn't do that, particularly where there's no planning. Um, this goes back to the petitioner's request, actually, in some regards to, to a moratorium. That's partly why a moratorium wouldn't be effective. Many of these um, uh, shared space schemes don't require, for example, a change in planning uh, at all. They're already spaces uh, that are, are, are uh, for designed for, for that use. Um, so in terms of the local authority, of course, we're, we're always happy to have conversations with, with in this case, in Eastern Barbershire. 
um, and others. Uh, on this, uh, the Equality and Human Rights Commission, of course, can also be asked to look into this yeah. matter if it's yeah. felt that uh, mm -hmm. the public sector duties are not being adhered to. Can I, can I ask if, a, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but can I ask if you would write to the local authority uh, in this instance to, to express your concern? Uh, I'll certainly have a conversation with the local authority and I'll report back to the member on that. I've got no uh, uh, concerns in, in, in doing that uh, at all. Ultimately, I would have to leave the decision for the local authority to, to, to make. Um, but I'm more than happy to have the conversation uh, with them. I suspect, having read their submission to the committee, that they would characterise what they've done slightly different to, the, to, to your characterisation. Yes. That uh, is, again, for not for me to be the arbiter uh, of that. But it seems to me that in any shared space, if there are these genuine concerns, the utmost should be done to try to resolve and try to give reassurances, particularly to our most vulnerable road users, which in yes. this case, of course, yes. are those with a disability or, or indeed a visual impairment. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Brian Pritchard. Um, looking at examples of shared space schemes that have been introduced in Scotland, we understand that some of these schemes have had controlled crossings added retrospectively. Um, Deafblind Scotland's submission on the petition noted the difficulties experienced by people who can neither see nor hear traffic. Uh, they highlighted that deafblind people rely on controlled crossings mainly with the road, rotating cones and tactile markings to alert them to uh, cross the road safely. Without such crossings and other elements of street design, the submission argues that the shared space may take away the independence of people leaving them feeling unsafe and lacking confidence, also excluding them from their town centre. Um, Deafblind Scotland question why aesthetic appeal should be given priority over safety. C can I ask you to respond to that point and set out how the Scottish Government supports the development of design that protects the safety of all users? I mean, I, I wouldn't uh, agree with the premise that aesthetics uh, uh, takes uh, priority uh, over the needs of particularly vulnerable uh, road users. I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept that for, this, for the point of view, from my point of view, uh, and what the guidance says, it doesn't suggest that uh, having a controlled crossing would suddenly uh, uh, deem a space no longer a, uh, a shared space. I know that uh, that is the opinion uh, of some. I think if uh, level crossings uh, are added in so that they make uh, the shared space more uh, appealing and, of course, actually are necessary, I should say, uh, for vulnerable road users, then there's no reason why they shouldn't be as part of the development and design stage uh, of a shared space. Uh, that is why we encourage and the guidance encourages collaboration right from the beginning, right from the inception or conception stage of an idea. Uh, local access panels and disability groups, uh, the one that the member mentions, they should be involved in those discussions. Uh, and if level crossings are necessary in a shared space, um, then there's no reason why they shouldn't be there from the very beginning as opposed to retrospectively being added in. Thank you. Okay, uh, Maurice Corey. Thank you, um, Yes, uh, Minister, the, the, the other element of the shared space schemes is the use of level services. And we appreciate there is a balance to be struck uh, here and that level services may be beneficial to some but not others. Um, however, a particular concern was raised about what level services mean for people who use guide dogs or long sticks. Uh, and long canes to navigate streets, uh, with curbs being an essential part of that navigation, uh, so they can't obviously feel when they get to the edge of the pavement. Um, this is recognised in designing streets under the heading of inclusive design, uh, which sets out the role of quality audit mm. uh, and the place for the collaborative design. Is there an area in, in relation to designing streets that you would consider strengthening or providing um, supplementary guidance on in respect to what I've just said? Yes, it uh, would, would be the short answer. I think from everything that members have said uh, and the concerns that Mr Taylor has, has raised in, in his petition, there's definitely merit uh, in us looking to, to examine the concerns that have been raised and my suggestion of doing that alongside Edinburgh Napier's uh, Transport Research Institute uh, would probably be the best forum by which to do that and I would invite, of course, uh, members uh, around the table here and uh, the petitioner himself to be involved in, in that discussion. Uh, it should be said that... Um, uh, in some shared spaces where there's uh, no curb, other measures have been put in place, so tactile paving, mm -hmm. uh, which I've mentioned, which members will, will understand. And even a slight delineation in the road, small one, 25 millimetres, for example, not a curb, and, uh, but so it has been, uh, in some instances, shown to, to, to provide the necessary 
um, um, delineation so that a, somebody using a stick or even uh, a guide dog would be able to notice a difference in the level surface is, 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 uh, uh, as subtle as it, as it may be. But um, certainly the member's suggestion of exploring that uh, further, I think, is, is a sensible one and uh, we, should, we should do that. So I think we certainly will. Uh, and as I've mentioned uh, on the back of uh, uh, Lord Holmes' um, uh, report into, into shared space, uh, the DFT are now doing some work and uh, the report is due to uh, Lord Ahmed of, of Wimbledon, who's the, uh, the, the minister leading uh, the, the response, uh, that report is due at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. And I'll be very, very interested to see the outcomes and the outputs of that. And I think that can inform our own discussions uh, here in Scotland as well. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask what the, the time scale for the forum being arranged might be? That would help out? Well, yes, uh, uh -huh. I was thinking that it would make sense to wait until the DFT report, uh, which is due at the end of the year, comes forward and that can perhaps also helped to inform us, but I think we should look to do it. Uh, I'll speak to, of course, Edinburgh and Apia, and I'll put them into, into uh, tie, tie, uh, put them into a, a, a timescale that they're not able to, uh, to, to be able to meet. But uh, I think we should look to do this early next year. Um, but again, we can explore the timescales if that can be done earlier. Uh, and the committee think there's merit in doing that earlier, then, then I'll explore that. But I think early next year uh, is when we should uh, explore to, to do this. Okay, thanks. Angus MacDonald. Okay, thanks, uh, convener. Um, one of the concerns raised by Sandy Taylor uh, ha ha has related to um, the issue of sources of funding available to, to assist local authorities in, in meeting the costs of redevelopment of areas. Um, specifically, he's mentioned funding allocated by Transport Scotland to SUSTRANS. Uh, now, his view is that uh, the scoring or the, the weighting given to applications for SUSTRANS funding have contributed to greater weight and focus being placed on meeting the needs of cyclists over other users. I'd be interested to hear your view on Sandy's view. Yes, again, I spoke to Mr Taylor just about that before we, we, we walked in and tried to, to give him some reassurance if I can. In the, in the first six months of this job, I've had uh, many a conversation with Sustrans, uh, Scotland, as you'd imagine, and um, their commitment to uh, inclusivity and accessibility is, uh, is beyond question. Uh, you know, an organisation there that uh, everything that they do, uh, they always take into account uh, how that can help uh, and how they can help and assist uh, and include the most vulnerable uh, as part of their ethos uh, for them, uh, primarily cycling, but also, of course, working with Path for All and other organisations so that walkways and pathway, uh, footways, uh, footpaths uh, are part of that conversation uh, as well. Uh, in terms of... Uh, uh, criteria for, for, for shared space uh, schemes, uh, Sustrans, uh, they, they, of course, any, any bid that they support uh, must comply with the national policy, the design guidance uh, that I've explained already, the Scots guidance and our own guidance, of course, from a national perspective. Um, and, 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 and that is part of what they do. I don't think there's a conflict uh, for them. I don't, you know, because a scheme um, receives assistance and funding from Sustrans, uh, that doesn't mean at all or give them any carte blanche to just ignore the needs uh, of, of, of uh, pedestrians uh, at all in favour of, for example, cyclists. Uh, in fact, Sustrans uh, are aware of the road user hierarchy, which I've already mentioned, which puts pedestrians first and the private uh, motor vehicle uh, last. Um, so uh, again, I have read Sustrans' submission um, to this uh, committee and I thought it was very powerful. Um, and so I have no uh, questions over there, uh, any potential conflict uh, at all in, in terms of uh, this scheme. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Rona Mackay. Thank you, convener. Um, yeah, another issue that's been raised with us um, by Sarah Gayton, a campaigner who's looked at shared space uh, schemes across the UK, is the collection of data on accidents in shared space schemes. Have any concerns been raised with the Scottish Government about the collection of data on accidents in these schemes? And just to uh, go back to what you were saying earlier about um, these schemes primarily or pr preferably being uh, initiated in residential areas, this particular one that the petitioner is um, uh, referring to is, is probably one of the busiest junctions in the west of Scotland with cars and lorries going through at alarming speed. Uh, a bus is, it's a, bu a big bus route, so it's, it's, it's far from a, a residential area. Yes, I, mean, I would just reiterate that the Designing Streets guidance is primarily focused towards uh, lightly trafficked and uh, residential area spaces. That's not to say 
though it excludes or explicitly excludes uh, town centres or even busier uh, areas, but clearly with those busy area, busier areas, the needs of vulnerable road users and uh, must be taken into must be taken into account, and those um, you know those uh, reassurances must be given to those individuals uh, as, as best as possible. I can tell from the submissions that you've had and the written submissions you've had to to your committee that disability groups and local access panels are not convinced uh, by the. Uh, plans the local authorities put forward and uh, as I said I've given a commitment to the member to speak to the local authority about uh, that because uh, clearly it's not just the voice of one petitioner uh, at all that uh, suggesting that these concerns exist. In terms of our uh, first question uh, and the pedestrians, uh, pedestrian injuries and pedestrian casualties, uh, the, the, thankfully the trajectory is, is a downward trajectory. Uh, of course, one uh, casualty and indeed uh, one fatality in our roads and our uh, shared spaces is, is, is one uh, too many. Uh, in terms of our specific question, uh, we don't have statistics for casualties specific to shared spaces. It's something I will speak to colleagues at Transport Scotland to explore whether that's possible, feasible, whether we're able to break it down by that, I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that it will be all that uh, easy to do, but uh, there's no harm in exploring uh, that issue. Thank you. Okay, Brian Mitchell. Just, just to follow on from that, I mean, if it was feasible to collect reliable accident data um, <coughs> uh, to, to understand whether the shared space scheme are creating a higher risk, and if it's found to be a, a, a higher risk in general, uh, or accidents associated with certain features of the shared space, where would you see the role for Scottish Government guidance in reflecting this risk? Well, if there was a, a, a risk, and uh, again, that's uh, not uh, my understanding. I've not had uh, correspondence uh, to suggest that would be the case. But if, hypothetically speaking, we collected the data and the data showed us, uh, then clearly uh, national guidance would have to reflect uh, the reasons for that. And if it was vulnerable road users, for example, uh, that were the victims of these uh, casualties, then we would have to, in our national guidance, uh, ensure that we put in additional measures uh, that gave them the reassurances that they needed, whether that was, for example, stipulating level crossings or any other such measure that would help to reduce casualties. We would look to do that, but uh, this is a... Uh, uber hypothetical scenario and we don't have the data yet we don't know if we're able to collect the data yet and we don't know if we do collect that data and are able to collect that data what it will reflect but I have to say thus far um, I have not had uh, correspondence to suggest that uh, those shared space schemes that exist currently uh, are, uh, are more dangerous or indeed uh, uh, even less dangerous than, uh, than other spaces on the road. Can I maybe just flag up some, another question that's been raised by Sustrans? Because in its response to the committee and the petition, it says, we contend that the introduction of controlled crossings into an infrastructure project in the urban realm causes that project to cease to be considered a shared space scheme and become a standard orthodox treatment for the urban environment, such as can be seen in many high streets in Scotland. Do you think that argument, we, we, you've said in you know, designing streets that there's, you can have a preference one way or another, and we've already con accepted that maybe you might want to strengthen that, is their contention that actually to do that stops it being a shared space? Does that match with your understanding of shared space as set out in policies and statements such uh, as designing yeah. streets? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I would say not necessarily. That is uh, their, their, their opinion. Um, designing streets doesn't go into definition of what a a shared space uh, necessarily constitutes and, and what exactly it is. Um, if we give general guidance and it's then for uh, local authorities and others to interpret that. But uh, no, I wouldn't say necessarily if there's a level crossing put in a shared space to make it uh, uh, more accessible for vulnerable road users, that should take away from it being quote unquote a, a shared space. So no, I, I don't share uh, that exact uh, interpretation, Convener. It's not a level crossing, but a controlled crossing. Yes, or a control crossing, or, or indeed a level crossing. Uh, you know, for me that, uh, you know, there can be other other characteristics of a shared space that still make it a shared uh, space. I mean, so what we what we're looking at in a shared space is the reduction of vehicle dominance, and if that can be produced, uh, and, and that can be the final output, uh, then I don't see why uh, that uh, shouldn't be uh, a shared space. But don't you think it's an issue that you're funding Sustrans, and they have a directly opposed view to you have about the 
what happens if you put controlled crossings into a shared space. They, would, they seem to be arguing that stops becoming a shared space. You're saying it doesn't, while at the same time our petitioner and others are concerned that because shared spaces presumably support the Sustrans view that you can't have controlled crossings, um, they're ending up in a position where they're no, concerned I mean, I think it's not being addressed. Uh, uh, this comes down to a matter of interpretation, uh, and that's why you know, the recommendation from petitioners, from members around the table, to see if we can strengthen the guidance, I think, is a good one. And Sustrans should be part uh, of that conversation. Mm. Local authorities should be part of that conversation. Um, but that is not uh, what I believe, for example, a local authority. They should be not taking guidance. Uh, they should be using our national guidance that we have produced from Designing Streets, but also Scots have produced. That should be their over overarching guidance. And that suggests in that guidance that any approach to a shared space should be inclusive of disability groups. And if that includes a level crossing, includes a control crossing, then I would have uh, no uh, concern. It would give me no concern from a governmental point of view uh, on, 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 on uh, you know, calling it a shared space. But I think that's uh, a matter of interpretation, but one that I'm happy for the guidance to, to be strengthened on. But surely, with respect, Sustrans, it shouldn't be a matter of interpretation. If you're funding them to deliver on national policy, you would expect them to have a position that understood that. You're clearly saying, and I recognise that, that there is a place for controlled crossings. Sustrans are saying, if there's a controlled crossing, that means it's no longer a shared space. And well, that seems to me, I mean, would it be fair then to say that it'd be worthwhile you exploring with Sustrans what their understanding of impact of putting in controlled crossings on your commitment to shared spaces, which are also safe for people with disabilities? Yes, I'm, I'm more than happy. And is, what I was about to say was that I'm more than happy to have that conversation uh, with Sustrans, although Sustrans receive our funding, as many organisations, uh, many bodies do, uh, you know, uh, my, the national guidance that we produce, the guidance that's produced by Scots, uh, should be what local authorities look towards when designing uh, their shared spaces, not what third party organisations necessarily, uh, or their guidance or their interpretation, it should be the guidance of designing streets uh, and, uh, and, and, and the guidance that's been produced by Scots. Uh, that I think uh, they should be looking towards. But of course, I'm more than happy to take uh, your suggestion, convener, and have a conversation with Sustrans about their understanding of a shared space. Okay, are there any further questions? Brian yeah, Quittle? Yes, can I, just, just a point of clarification really on, on a point made earlier. I just wanted to, from my own uh, peace of mind here, if, if local authorities are deemed to contravene uh, an inclusive policy, uh, what would the Scottish Government's position be and potential action? As, as guidance as opposed to, to what's in the, in the statute, uh, and so when it comes to that guidance, uh, there are, uh, as I've mentioned in my earlier remarks, uh, you know, organisations, individuals can seek redress through the Equality and Human Rights Commission because every local authority must uh, live up to its public sector duty, so if they're seen to be in contradiction to that. Uh, and then, of course, the, 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 there may be a last resort of, of going down the courts, but it shouldn't have to... Um, as the convener has already suggested, uh, get down there. But I would hope that there would be a resolution before it got to that stage. And um, petitions, of course, uh, allow some of those issues to be aired. But, uh, of course, as a government minister, I wouldn't look to, you know, uh, you know do, uh, for example, impose my view on every high street and every local authority in Scotland. But I'm more than happy where appropriate, as has been suggested today, have a conversation with the local authority to express concerns that have been expressed um, to me and see if we can come to some sort of resolution on that. But the guidance is very, very clear, both from a national level and from a local level, that including disability groups and access panels from the very, very beginning uh, is, is, is the best approach to take. Mm. Uh, so, so, sorry. Uh, to ju just, it just seems to me that, uh, uh, quite an arduous process uh, that this petitioner has had to go through to, to get uh, their, their views aired. And I know we can't speak on specifics here, and you've already committed to speaking to the local authority. And it just, as I said, it seems to me a very arduous process to get to a point where you know, views are heard. And uh, my concern would be that many people in the same position would probably give up before they got to here. Mm. Well, I mean, that's a fair point, uh, I think, to make. And again, if I can suggest for the seminar that's, um, that I've committed to, to doing to explore some of these issues, perhaps that can be one of the, the issues that we discuss about, uh, you know, if there are real issues of concern, not just one lone voice, uh, but in you know, this case, it seems to me there's a number of voices that share those concerns. 
that the process um, uh, is made easier to, to to appeal. But you know, essentially, it's up to whether or not local authorities choose to listen to those voices or not. Uh, and again, I'm not making a, a judgment on a specific or individual case. But if there are 10 or 20 you know, disability organisations and local access panels saying the same thing, I think it would be an abdication of responsibility from a local authority to just ignore those um, or, or sweep those to the side. Again, I'm not making that uh, on the specific uh, case of this petition, but I'm just saying generally that wouldn't be a, a particularly wise approach. You think a local authority should listen to, to those voices, um, but if the guidance needs strengthened to, to, to try to, to encourage that in a, in a, in a stronger way, then... Um, we can explore that. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much. Um, we obviously now have to think about how we want to take this petition forward. Can I maybe say from my point of view, I think the Minister says that the guidance is very clear, but it, clear is, it, it would seem that as far as at local level, that it's not very clear and there is some, certainly some dispute with Sustrans and others about what the guidance actually means. I think, certainly I think perhaps it might suggest that we would seek following this session that the Scottish Government comes back, really sort of looks at and indicates how they would be looking to uh, strengthen the guidance or to respond to the, the concerns that have been raised. Um, I would also be interested if the, the Scottish Government would be willing in general terms to raise this question with local authorities because I recognise we can't in the petition deal with the specific petition but with the issues that more broadly that are highlighted. I think we would be asking um, the Scottish Government to do that and I think we would welcome the forum um, and maybe at some point we can get correspondence back from the Scottish Government about when that would be and how you envisage that what the aims of it would be and what would you see coming out the other end of it I don't know if other members have other suggestions of what we might do Rona? I, I agree with what, everything that you said there um, and I, I would also like to um, take the petition uh, to the Equalities Committee because I believe this council is not complying with the Equality Act 2010 and I think it would be uh, good if they could have a look at it to, to give an opinion on that. I'm not quite sure how we would do that. I mean, I think, first of all, I think we need to take the issue as opposed to the local authority, mm -hmm. given we're in terms of dealing with because the local authority has not been able to um, argue its position. So the question is, you know, is the guidance strong enough to protect the rights of people with disabilities and our shared spaces as an idea actually problematic for people in terms of equalities? And perhaps when we get information back from the Scottish Government, we then might want to refer the petition at that point. I think if we refer it, we then let go of it. it. So yeah, that no, might be something no, we want to look at further. Agreed, yeah. But I think we've also heard from the Minister today, specific to the petitioner, that there are avenues open to, to him in terms of taking it forward as well. Are there any other suggestions? No? Okay. I think that has been um, a very useful discussion. Can I thank the Minister very much um, and his officials for their attendance this morning and for the commitments they have made in terms of addressing the petition and can I suspend the meeting till I have a change over of witnesses?